Que... <laughs> so, hey everyone, I'm Sam Dutton, a developer relations engineer with the Chrome team. And I'm Erin Walsh, a developer relations engineer with Android. Now, you may have heard Chrome is planning to restrict third-party cookies by default. So, if you have a website, you need to act now. Um, you know, it's great to see so many people here at I.O. today, and hello to everyone watching online. Uh, you know, the fact that you're here, you know, you clearly understand just how important third-party cookie deprecation is to the future of the web platform. So, we're going to show you some tools and techniques to help you transition away from third-party cookies, and we're going to show you some brand new APIs and features in Chrome. But first up, there are two things you need to do right now. Well, after you watch the session. Yeah, please. <laughs> First, restrict third-party cookies and test your site for breakage. And second, report any breakage caused by third-party cookies restrictions. A third-party cookie means any cookie from any site that's different from the top-level site, which is the site shown in the URL bar in your browser. And as Sam will explain later, that can be cookies from a third party or cross-site cookies from another service or a domain that you run yourself. By far, the best way to test for breakage Sorry. is when third-party cookies are restricted is by setting the third-party cookie phase-out flag in Chrome. This simulates the state of Chrome after third-party cookie phase-out. The phase-out flag causes Chrome to restrict third-party cookies and ensures that new features and mitigations are active. And you can set the flag from the Chrome Flags page or from the command line to help you with automated testing. And you should report breakage you experience caused by third-party cookie restrictions. So go to the URL shown here and submit a breakage report. That enables us to help you yeah. and helps Chrome engineers understand where the sites are experiencing problems. Now, let's expand on that a little bit. I think there are four phases to transitioning from third-party cookies. First, understand third-party cookie deprecation, then audit your site for cookies, test for breakage, and transition to privacy-preserving alternatives. So Sam is going to take you through this process now. Brilliant. Thank you, Aaron. So first up, of course, you need to understand the timeline for third-party cookie deprecation. So to help with testing, uh, since January this year, Chrome has restricted third-party cookies for a random 1% of Chrome stable clients globally and for 20% of Canary, Dev, and Beta channels. Now, that 1% group of Chrome clients that have third-party cookies blocked by default is known as the tracking protection group. And as well as third-party cookie restrictions, users in that 1% group are shown the new tracking protection page in Chrome settings that you see here. And you'll also see tracking protection in the dialog, you know, when you click the eye icon to temporarily allow third-party cookies for the current site. Now, the 1% testing period continues through the second half of 2024. And then, subject to resolving any competition concerns, we plan to begin rolling out third-party cookie phase-out and the tracking protection UI to all Chrome clients in early 2025. So, you know, what you need to do right now, if you haven't done it already, is to audit cookie usage on your site, you know, to understand where and when third-party cookies are being used and might cause breakage. Now, one thing to clarify here, when we talk about third-party cookies, well, you know, we actually mean cross-site cookies. Uh, you know, that means a cookie from any site that's different from the top-level site. Like you know, Aaron said, the site that's shown in the URL bar in your browser. So you can see from the examples here, uh, you know, third-party cookies can be from a third party, like something like an analytics service or ad tech. But cross-site cookies can also be from a different domain belonging to the same first party. Now, for example, your company might own, I don't know, different brands or sites with different country domains. 
Now, for better or worse, cross-site cookies are known as third-party cookies. You know, even when they are set by a site that's uh, you know owned by the same party as the top-level site. So, just so you're aware of that. And you know, when you're auditing cookie usage, you need to focus on the most important features of your site, of course. But you know, you need to check where third-party cookies are required for critical user journeys. And You know that might be for sign-in, checkout,、uh, embedded content, fraud checks, whatever.、Uh, I mean, in other words, you, don't, you just need to be really sure that you're not missing anything that's essential for your users. So, first stop for checking cookie usage in Chrome is Chrome DevTools. Now, the DevTools, DevTools Issues panel is a great place to start. And as you can see, this lists、uh, potential third-party cookie problems, and from there you can go deeper in the network and application panels. Now we've also built the Privacy Sandbox Analysis Tool, known as PSAT, and this is a Chrome extension that builds on Chrome DevTools, and it has you know this really useful set of features that will help you transition away from third-party cookies. And actually, one thing here is that PSAT is also a great way to visualise, you know, how third-party cookies are being used on your site, and that can help you get the message across, like to other teams within your organisation. So later in this session, we'll show you some great tips and tricks with PSAT and Chrome DevTools. And yeah, you can get PSAT by following this link. Now, next up. Testing for breakage. So once you've worked out how your site uses third-party cookies, you need to test for where there will be breakage when third-party cookies are restricted. Now the best way to test for breakage, like Aaron said, is to use Chrome flags. You can set these from the Chrome flags page or use them from the command line, you know, to adjust the way Chrome works. And like Aaron said earlier, there is one flag in particular that you will definitely want to use. So the phase-out flag simulates the state of Chrome after third-party cookie phase-out, and this sets Chrome to restrict third-party cookies, and it also ensures that new features and mitigations are in place.、Uh, you could, for example, use the command line flag to do like parallel runs of test suites to check for errors. You know, running Chrome with the flag set to enabled or disabled, and Like we said, we would also like you to report breakage,、uh, any breakage you experience when third-party cookies are restricted. So you just go to the URL here that's shown here, and you know submit a breakage report. Now, if all else fails, or you just have like general questions about third-party cookie deprecation, you can file an issue on our support repo. So go to the URL shown here. Keep saying that, and、uh, create a third-party cookie deprecation issue. Now, the final phase: once you've audited third-party cookie usage and tested for breakage, is to begin the process of transitioning away from third-party cookies. So, Chrome and other browsers are implementing multiple new technologies to help you do just that. So, partitioned cookies, known as chips, the storage access API. Related website sets,、uh, FedCM, and, and lots more besides. And、uh, you know, we'll give you a quick introduction to all of these later on. Now, we've also developed new APIs for advertising use cases that don't rely on third-party cookies. So, the Protected Audience API allows you to use data from one app or site、uh, to select an ad when a user is visiting another app or site. The attribution reporting API enables ad measurement, and the private aggregation API supports aggregation and reporting on cross-site data.、Uh, topics is for interest-based advertising, and Aaron's going to tell you more about these as well. Now, one thing I wanted to say here: now is the moment, you know, to clean up your use of cookies and third-party services. Definitely.、Uh, yeah, I mean. Third-party cookie deprecation means it's a great time to do some housekeeping on your third-party tags, and to look at how your site handles personal data and identifiers.、Uh, and this can help you, you know, pay down technical debt and reduce the burden of data that you handle. 
So, to recap, Chrome plans to begin phasing out third-party cookies in early 2025, which means you need to audit your site for third-party cookies right now, and you need to test for breakage. And you know, whatever you do with cookies on your site, it really makes sense right now to transition to these alternatives like chips and related website sets. So, yeah, if you only do one thing after this session, use the phase-out flag to test for breakage and report breakage using the link shown here. Now, Aaron, what I'd like you to explain, though, is, uh, you know, why is all this actually happening? You know, in other words, why are third-party cookies being deprecated? That's a really great question, Sam. Yeah. Why are web browsers, including Chrome, deprecating third-party cookies? We've had third-party cookies for nearly three decades. And if it ain't broke, why fix it, right? Yeah, Aaron's right. I mean, we need to back up a little here, I think. So Aaron's going to explain why browsers need to restrict third-party cookies. And I know some of you have heard this before, but you know, it bears repeating. So go, Aaron. Thanks, Sam. So you might have seen this slide from Google I.O. a couple years ago. It's a typical site with components from different sources. We have a map from one origin, some script from another, and, of course, some advertising. The ability to combine first and third-party content and services is the web's superpower. We call it composability. So what's wrong with that? The trouble is, the web is built on technologies that were not designed for privacy. In the early days of the web, privacy just wasn't a primary concern. But then the web evolved and opened up unexpected privacy yep. challenges. Sure did. <laughs> In particular, the web has used unpartitioned mechanisms, including cookies and storage APIs, to save data on a user's device, but also to share data across origins. In addition, covert tracking has been used to combine information about a given browser and device to uniquely profile and identify users without the user's knowledge. So I'm sure your website uses services from other companies to provide analytics, serve content, do lots of really useful stuff. And historically, the web has relied on third-party cookies and other tracking mechanisms to support identity services, fraud detection, and other critical use cases. Most notably, ads are included in web pages using third-party JavaScript and iframes. Ad views, clicks, and conversions are tracked using third-party cookies and scripts. And research shows that people really care about being in control of their data. Privacy concerns increasingly drive choices about what people are doing online. And regulators around the world are stepping up to the privacy requirements. And this is all happening really quickly. Yeah. So the Privacy Sandbox is an initiative which aims at enabling a new identity model for the web in accordance with these principles. The Privacy Sandbox has three major goals. First, remove unpartitioned storage, deprecate unrestricted third-party cookies, and refactor storage APIs. Second, implement effective privacy-preserving alternatives to meet the existing use cases. And third, block covert tracking techniques. Yeah, thanks, Aaron, for that. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that third-party cookies are being deprecated and browsers are taking other measures to block covert tracking techniques like fingerprinting. So if you have a website, you need to upgrade and you need to do that now. And, you know, I think the, the good news is that this is really a great moment for the web. You know, at the end of all this, we'll have a better web platform. Uh, you know, we've had cookies since 1994, and they've been shoehorned into these use cases that they were never intended for. But now we have this opportunity, I think, to prepare for the future with browsers that are safer, more secure, more effective, and, you know, with APIs that are built for the job. And, you know, we understand that this is going to be tough for sites, but we are here to help. So we're providing tooling, resources, and support to help you transition away from third-party cookies. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the uh, tools that can help you understand cookie usage on your site and test for breakage when third-party cookies are restricted. So first up, back to our old friend, Chrome DevTools. 
Uh, the cookies tab in the network panel lists cookies and explains why they're being blocked for a specific request. Now, the simplest way to find third-party cookies is to check the same site cookie attribute. The same site attribute of a set cookie handler can be a header, sorry, can be set by a server to specify when a cookie will be sent. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Cross-site cookies must be marked as same site, none, secure. Otherwise, they won't be sent on cross-site requests. And this means that you can find third-party cookies by checking for cookies that have a same site, none attribute. Now, in the Chrome DevTools uh, application panel, you can see the cookie section lists cookies by origin, and uh, it also explains why they're being blocked. And you can see here that all the blocked cookies are same site, none. Now, of course, the simplest way to drill down into cookie usage in DevTools is with the issues panel. So this lists cookies that are blocked, uh, explains why they're blocked, and then links to them in the network and uh, in the uh, network panel cookies tab. Now, our team, like we said, is also working on a Chrome extension that builds on Chrome DevTools to help you understand cookie usage and help you transition away from third-party cookies. So, yeah, this is the Privacy Sandbox Analysis Tool, better known as PSAT, and you can download it from the Chrome Web Store. Here's the URL for that. And just by the way, we will share these URLs uh, at the end of the session as well. And like I said before, PSAT is also this great way to visualize third-party cookies. You know, it's really useful for sharing across teams, especially if you're trying to motivate colleagues who, you know, aren't developers, uh, who just need this kind of simple overview of what's happening with third-party cookies. So you can run PSAT from the command line. Uh, you can even pass it a sitemap to uh, process multiple pages. You get insights into the type of cookies that are used and the reasons that cookies are blocked. And, uh, you know, for each cookie, you get, like, blockage information. And you also get information about cookies and iframes, so visible or hidden. Now, the code for the PSAT extension is available from GitHub. Uh, you can file issues and feature requests there as well. Patches, always welcome, of course. Definitely. And actually, you know, one of my favorite things about this repo is the, uh, is the wiki, which has really useful tips to help you understand cookie usage. OK, let's talk briefly about Chrome flags again. So yeah, as you know, Chrome fly provides flags for developers to adjust browser behavior and help with testing. And you can set these from the Chrome Flags page or from the command line, like Aaron said. And you know there are lots of flags to fine-tune Chrome to test third-party cookie deprecation scenarios. Uh, for example, you can disable heuristics-based mitigations. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But uh, you know, that can be useful for testing that longer-term fixes uh, working as expected, yeah, you know, without relying on these temporary mitigations. Now, just to reiterate again, <laughs> the best way to test for breakage is by setting the third-party cookie phase-out flag in Chrome, and yeah, this simulates the state of Chrome after third-party cookie phase-out. So, the phase-out flag causes Chrome to restrict third-party cookies and ensures you know, new features and mitigations are active, and. Just to repeat, you can set it from the Chrome Flags page or from the command line. Now, as well as blocking third-party cookies by default, the phase-out flag also causes Chrome to use the tracking protection UI. So you know, here you can see what happens when you click the eye icon in the address bar on a site that uses third-party cookies. Uh, same as it does for all users now, but you know, notice tracking protection name in the dialog there. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the eye icon enables the user to temporarily allow third-party cookies for the current site, and the site is added to the sites allowed to use third-party cookies uh, with an expiry date, which is 90 days, in fact. Now, as you can see, tracking protection provides a new Chrome settings page rather than the old cookies page, since that doesn't really make sense, you know, now that, like, 
with third-party cookies are being blocked by default. Now, you can find out lots more about Chrome flags for testing from the short link here. And by the way, uh, to help support testing, Chrome is providing labels for groups of a percentage of Chrome clients, and this is called Chrome Facilitated Testing. So the labels for Chrome clients that are in a Chrome facilitated, Chrome facilitated testing group can be accessed from a JavaScript API or an HTTP header. Um, Chrome facilitated testing is primarily oriented to testing for ad tech. Uh, so you know, if you're interested, you can find out more from our documentation. Just go to the URL shown there. There's lots more about Chrome facilitated testing. Um, one last thing for testing. We have some sites that you know, we think you might find useful. Uh, the first one, thirdpartycookies.glitch.me. It does just one thing. It attempts to set a third-party cookie. Uh, I know that might sound a little strange, but you know, this can be really handy for working out how different flags and settings affect whether third-party cookies are allowed or blocked. Uh, the privacy sandbox demos, I, I mean, this is a great set of sites, honestly. Uh, so this provides linked sites to help you experiment with a variety of use cases uh, and kind of you know, user journeys uh, to understand how these are affected by third-party cookie restrictions. Uh, for example, stuff like identity, payments, embedded content wi widgets, uh, recapture, lots more stuff there, really useful stuff. And yeah, here's the link for that. So we know there's a lot of work to be done, uh, you know, but we will help you where we can. Uh, so just to reiterate, you should report problems you're experiencing when third-party cookie blocking causes breakage, and you can get support by filing an issue on our support repo. But wait, Sam, what if you can't uh, fix your site in time? Yeah. As the web platform transitions from third-party cookies, we need to avoid breakage. What about essential sites for critical use yeah. cases? And what about the long tail of sites that are unsupported? Yeah, yeah. So Aaron is absolutely right. You know, cross-site cookies, of course, have been a critical part of the web for over a quarter of a century now. And that makes any change, especially you know, breaking changes, uh, a complex process that needs coordinated, incremental approach. So as with many previous deprecations on the web, we understand that there are cases where sites will need extra time to make the necessary changes and to preserve you know, critical user experiences. So there are three ways that Chrome is temporarily allowing sites to continue using third-party cookies to make sure that you have time to adapt. Deprecation trials, heuristics-based exceptions, and you know, Chrome enterprise policies. So Aaron is going to take you through these now. Thanks, Sam. First up, we have deprecation trials. A deprecation trial is a type of Chrome origin trial that allows a feature undergoing deprecation to be temporarily re-enabled. Third-party cookie deprecation trials provide a way for sites and services experiencing breakage to request additional time and migrate away from third-party cookie dependencies. We have two trials for first-party and third-party use cases. So to be eligible for either of the available trials, you need to demonstrate breakage in user journeys that is not related to ads use cases. So one thing to clarify here, yeah. a deprecation trial is to temporarily re-enable a feature that has been yeah. deprecated. A deprecation trial is not a trial to deprecate a feature. And if you have ideas for a better please. name, please <laughs> come talk to us after, after, the, after session. the session. Love to know. Yeah. So to reiterate, the third-party cookie deprecation trials will temporarily allow access to third-party cookies. So before applying for either of the deprecation trials, you must report the functionality that will be broken by third-party cookie restrictions at the URL shown here. So like I said, there are two third-party third third cookie deprecation trials. The third-party trial is for third-party use cases. For example, if you provide services or embeds that set cross-site cookies. So remember the cat site? Yeah. <laughs> you can apply for that trial, or for the trial, on Chrome's origin trial site. And to clarify, it's a third-party <laughs> deprecation trial for third-party cookies that can be used with third-party matching. So <laughs> yeah, you got yeah. that? <laughs> OK. <laughs> 
If your site relies on third-party services and third-party cookie restrictions have caused breakage on your site, you may be eligible for deprecation trial for top-level sites. We're offering a deprecation trial for top-level sites experiencing breakage due to third-party cookie issues with third-party embeds or services. This trial is intended for situations where it is impossible or impractical to get all affected third-party providers to sign up for the third-party deprecation trial. Again, you apply for the trial on Chrome's origin trial site. Now, to minimize user friction while sites deploy tokens for the deprecation trials, Chrome is providing a grace period to temporarily re-enable third-party cookies for sites with reported user-facing breakage for non-ads use cases. Of course, sites that are eligible for the grace period will still need to work towards transitioning away from third-party cookies. But during the grace period, origins registered for one of the deprecation trials will have access to third-party cookies in Chrome, even if they have not yet deployed their tokens. So to take advantage of the deprecation trials, you need to act now. You can find out more from our third-party deprecation trial guidance and from our first-party deprecation trial guidance from these links. So next up, we have heuristics exceptions. During third-party cookie phase-out, Chrome uses heuristics that grant temporary access to third-party cookies for predefined flows in specific scenarios in order to mitigate breakage. This is primarily for authentication flows, where a top-level site either opens a pop-up window or redirects to a third-party site for an operation, and then returns to the top-level site, making use of a cookie either on that return journey or in the embedded context. In specific scenarios like this, the browser will automatically grant third-party cookie access based on certain confidence signals. And just to reiterate, heuristics exceptions are a temporary measure. And the expectation is that the heuristics will be removed completely in the future as the sites migrate to long-term solutions. So you can learn more from our documentation about the specific scenarios where Chrome would automatically grant third-party cookie access. The documentation also links to a demo that lets you test third-party cookie access with and without heuristics exceptions. And here's the link for that. Finally, in Chrome's mitigation for sites that need more time to transition from third-party cookies, let's take a moment mm -hmm. to talk about Chrome Enterprise installations. So does anybody here work in a Chrome Enterprise context? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, enterprise managed Chrome has unique requirements compared to general web usage. And Chrome Enterprise administrators have additional controls over third-party cookie access for their users. As with the majority of Chrome experiments, most Chrome Enterprise end users will be excluded from the 1% third-party cookie restrictions automatically. That's the 1% tracking protection group that we mentioned earlier. So for the users that may still be affected, there are short-term solutions that can be applied while working to remove reliance on third-party cookies. So Chrome Enterprise provides two policies to allow or block third-party cookies for users. Setting the block third-party cookies Chrome Enterprise policy to disabled allows cross-site cookies. And setting the policy to enabled prevents those pages from setting third-party cookies. Leaving the policy unset allows third-party cookies by default and enables users to block third-party cookies from Chrome settings. So to allow third-party cookies only on specific sites, add the sites to the cookies allowed for URLs policy. And here's a tip. Yeah. The Chrome policy page shows if your browser is administered by a Chrome Enterprise installation, and you can check policies affecting your browser. So this is what Chrome policy looks like yeah. for a Chrome administered as a Chrome Enterprise yeah. installation. My Chrome. Sans. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what Chrome policy looks like for a Chrome client that is not administered by Chrome Enterprise. And as you can see, there are no policies in place. So if you are in a Chrome Enterprise environment, be aware that policies in place on your browser may result in an experience that's different than from what your users encounter, and the other way around. So for testing, you might want to consider using a virtual machine or a device that's not managed, or borrow one from your Android coworker. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
But what about the privacy sandbox? Where does that fit into all of this? Well, privacy sandbox is a set of technologies to satisfy a variety of use cases without using third-party cookies or other tracking mechanisms. The Privacy Sandbox team is developing multiple APIs, features, and tooling for the web in order to help you transition away from third-party cookies. And Sam is going to run through each of these now. Yeah. Thanks, Heron. So first up, chips. Uh, full name, cookies having independent partitioned state. Uh, now, without cookie partitioning, third-party cookies can enable services to track users and join their information from across many unrelated top-level sites. And yeah, this is known as cross-site tracking. Cookies marked partitions are double-keyed. So by the origin that sets them, as well as the origin of the top-level site. And yeah, to use chips, you just add the partitioned attribute when you set a cookie. And it must be secure as well. Now, partitioned cookies, chips, will not be blocked by third-party restrictions, OK? So you know, whatever you're doing with cookies, you should consider, wherever possible, partitioning cookies for use cases such as cross-site embeds. Now, next up, storage access. Uh, storage access is a JavaScript API. It allows iframes to request storage access permission when you know, that access would otherwise be denied by browser settings. Now, embeds with use cases that depend on loading cross-site resources can use the API to request access permission from the user as they need it. And so the storage access API provides a way for embedded cross-site content to check whether it currently has access to browser-based storage, such as cookies, and to request storage access if it doesn't. Now, so the API has two methods, has storage access and request storage access. And by the way, has storage access is also available now under its new name, has unpartitioned cookie access. Now, the first time request storage access is called, the user may need to approve this access with a browser prompt. But the prompt may be skipped by the browser and permission automa automatically provided in certain circumstances, including if the embedded iframe is part of a related website set, uh, which brings me to our next topics. So related website sets is a web platform mechanism to help browsers understand the relationships between a collection of domains. So sites in a related website set can request storage access programmatically without requiring the user to accept a prompt. Now, for example, your organization might have you know, multiple country code, uh, top-level domains, or services and sites on different domains. And these domains can be added to a related website set. To set up a related website set, you first need to provide a JSON file in the well-known directory on your websites, and that specifies the structure of your set. Next, you submit your set to the related website sets repository on GitHub, and this repo maintains the canonical list of related website sets as a publicly viewable JSON file. And finally, FedCM. So, Federated Credential Management uh, provides a standardized mechanism for identity providers to make their services available on the web in a privacy-preserving way, but without the need for third-party cookies and redirects. So FedCM has two parts, a standard that defines what an identity provider needs to make available so that a website you know, known as a relying party can integrate with it, uh, and also a JavaScript API to enable federated authentication for activities such as signing in or signing up on a website. Now, Google Identity Services has moved to FedCM. And here you can see the updated one-tap experience and auto sign-in uh, user prompts there. Now, you can find out lots more about FedCM in our friend Melissa's Google I.O. talk, uh, which is how to use pass keys and FedCM. Check it out. Yeah, take a look. Um, I just want to have a quick look at these solutions kind of in practice. So PayPal, uh, you know, they offer fast, secure online payments around the world. They've implemented chips 
to partition their cookies where PayPal is embedded on the merchant site. And you know, PayPal was able to complete this implementation with the effort of one developer in one month. Wow. If PayPal can do it, you can do it too. So yeah, the next one is, I'm going to talk about is Make My Trip. This is a leading online travel company in India. Uh, and they identified that a critical user, internal user journey actually, was breaking without third-party cookies because employees needed to authenticate the key tool across domains. Uh, Make My Trip implemented chips to enable partitioning of cookies for their embedded workflow. And that was also completed by one developer in a single month. Uh, Mercado Libra, which is Latin America's largest e-commerce site, uh, they implemented related website sets to preserve critical user experiences across multiple domains that they own. And you know, a single developer, again, completed this work in less than a quarter, which is pretty amazing. And finally, Times Internet, a large news publisher and digital products company in India, identified a breakage in their own single sign-on identity services when third-party cookies were disabled. And they successfully implemented FedCM as a solution. So yeah, this is just a sampling of some of the successful implementations of Privacy Sandbox solutions. Uh, you can find more about how businesses are successfully transitioning away from third-party cookies from the case studies on our site. And we'll share URLs for those later. Now, a world without third-party <laughs> cookies sounds really great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the web can benefit from ads. Ads are what keep the internet free. Advertisers need ads to drive awareness and sell their products or services, and publishers need ads to support their sites. So that's why the Privacy Sandbox is focusing on enabling ads use cases while still improving user privacy. Yeah, I mean, I understand why ads are important, but you know, without third-party cookies, Aaron, could you explain like, how would an ad tech know what a user is interested in in order to select relevant ads? It's a good question. So that's where the Privacy Sandbox Topics API right. comes in. Topics analyzes browsing history, and based on the websites a user visits, or the apps on their phone, Topics determines a few broad interest categories that represent the user's interests. So for instance, if you recently visited a website about cats, like I did, yeah. the Topics <laughs> API could recommend pets and animals dash cats as an interest category. Uh, so when an ad tech wants to show an ad that would be interesting to a certain user, like me, that ad tech can request topics from the browser or a mobile device. The Topics API will return up to three topics that represent the past three weeks of a user's browsing history. So here you can see the Topics internals page in Chrome showing the topics recorded for me after I visited a website about cats, as I often do. Yeah. <laughs> in this way, the Topics API can replace the use of third-party cookies to enable interest-based advertising use cases while protecting privacy. It reduces tracking by sharing broad interest categories instead of specific browsing history. And it avoids sensitive categories like race and gender. And Topics allows a higher level of user control. So users can disable individual topics that they're not interested in. And then there's the Protected Audience API. And that allows you to use data from one app or site to select an ad when the user is visiting a different app or site. Yeah, yeah. So you mean like those ads, you know, show me a washing machine when I just <laughs> purchased a washing machine. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly yeah. like that. We'll have that. But those <laughs> ads can significantly increase conversion rates. True. Plus, you never know who's starting their washing machine collection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the protected audience API enables ad auctions while protecting user data to improve privacy. An ad tech can use the protected audience API to implement a custom audience use case by creating and managing interest groups. These interest groups represent an audience that the buyer will target the ad to, such as orange cat owners. When a user visits a site that wants to advertise its products, an interest group owner, such as an ad tech demand side platform, or a DSP, can ask the user's browser to add membership to that interest group. So once a user's browser has joined an interest group, 
A publisher site that wants to display an ad can ask the browser to start an auction where ads campaigns associated with that interest group can participate. So if the user is an orange cat owner, <laughs> the next time they visit their favorite news site, the site's ad tech can use protected audience to select ads that are appropriate for cat owners. So maybe you could show them an ad for some cat food. Yeah, that's good. In a protected audience auction, the buyer provides the logic to generate the bid, and the auction calculates the bid using that logic. This is in contrast to other auction architectures where you submit the bid directly as opposed to providing the logic. Once the bids have been generated, the auction fetches the scoring logic from the seller to calculate the desirabil desirability score for each bid. And the ad bid with the highest desirability score is proclaimed the winner of a protected audience auction. So the protected audience API supports both buy and sell side, with buyers managing the interest groups and bidding logic, and the sellers implementing ad selection and scoring. And once the ads have been served to a user, the Privacy Sandbox offers a way to measure the performance. In the past, ads measurement has used third-party cookies. But with the Attribution Reporting API, measurement partners can track ad interactions, such as clicks or views, and receive two types of reports without the use of cross-site and cross-app identifiers. Event-level reports deliver limited information about specific conversions. And summary reports give an overview of chosen metrics. For example, a summary report could tell you how much money an ad campaign has made in the United States. And for those of you who work with mobile apps as well as websites, the Attribution Reporting API can even measure ad performance across platforms on the same device. Yeah, that's pretty good. So with app to web and web to app reporting, measurement partners can attribute a conversion made on an app seen an app that was shown on an app, uh, sorry, <laughs> made yeah. an ad seen on an app that was shown on the web yeah. and uh, the other way around. To recap, the Privacy Sandbox private advertising APIs include topics to support interest-based advertising, protected audience to support the bidding and auction process, and attribution reporting to support ads measurement. And all of these APIs are available on both web and mobile platforms and include shared services that work across platforms to support a well-rounded and privacy-forward ecosystem. So be sure to talk to your third-party ads providers and use the API's resources and tooling to move away from using cross-site and app identifiers in your ads solutions. So now that we understand why third-party cookies are being deprecated, how to audit your site for cookies, test your site for breakage, and how to implement privacy-forward solutions, where do we go from here? And as we move towards solutions without cross-site and app identifiers, it will change the privacy landscape and enhance privacy not just on the web, but everywhere on the internet. Yeah, in order to do that, you know, we know we need to make big changes like deprecating third-party cookies. And yeah, this may seem like a lot, but you know, the web is always changing, and, and that's a good thing, yeah? Uh, we know that moving forward towards privacy-enhancing solutions can be a difficult adjustment, but history shows that that's always worth doing. Now, back in 2014, the internet started moving from HTTP to HTTPS, and this you know, really was a challenging moment for many sites, and there were valid concerns uh, with the move to HTTPS. But, you know, we got there through discussion and collaboration across the web ecosystem. And HTTPS is now widely considered the standard protocol. And the internet is much more secure. Now the data transmission between websites and users is, uh, you know, stuff like login credentials is encrypted, yeah? Uh, likewise for HTML5, you know, remember this logo? <laughs> Makes me feel kind of nostalgic, you know, the olden days. Anyway, HTML5, you know, offered so much stuff like cross-platform compatibility, features like geolocation, offline capabilities, uh, media support, you know, like, wow, video built into the browser, amazing. Lots of other benefits. But, you know, part of the migration was also about deprecating plugins and uh, many commonly used HTML tags such as font, and frame. And again, you know, this was a major challenge for many sites. But, you know, transitioning to purpose-built APIs and features built into the web platform 
with better security, better performance, yeah, it was definitely worth the effort. Now, you know, I think we're at that point now with third-party cookies. Definitely. So, yeah, the web platform has always been moving to pay down technical debt. Uh, moving away from third-party cookies results in a better web platform and provides users with a safer, more effective web browser. So we've had cookies since 1994. Now, you know, it's time. There's this opportunity to move forward towards this future of privacy. And you know, we really appreciate that you're all here to do just that. So how do you get started? Well, you need to transition your existing sites, like we say, from using third-party cookies to privacy-preserving alternatives. And start your integrations with the Privacy Sandbox Ads API solutions so that you don't need cross-site and app identifiers. And one more time, here are some URLs to help you do those things. You can report breakage uh, and get support, Android documentation, and finally, the landing page for all of our resources. Yeah. yeah. And you know, tell us, what do you need during this transition? We want to know. So any feedback helps us make third-party cookie deprecation yeah, an easier process for everyone. So thank you so much all for being here today and watching our session. Yeah, thank you. And we'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>